Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Art 186, Computer Graphics with Adobe Illustrator for the spring semester 2022. Uh, where we left off last Thursday, I think it was Thursday. No, it must have been Tuesday, because I think I had to cancel our meeting on Thursday. Um, anyway, was uh, working with color in Adobe Illustrator. And one of the things that I had problems with was um, at the very end was obviously able to, you know, find it right after we ended it, uh, ended our webinar, is that um, what they wanted was the Pantone Plus solid uncoded. And if you use the bottom here to scroll through these, if I just, you know, you can find different color um, choices here, cool, dark, or you could just use the library button down here. What they what they wanted us to do was to go through color proper no color books, and I selected the Pantone CMYK uncoded. That's not what they wanted. They wanted the one down here, <clears throat> um, Pantone Plus solid coded. So if I were to select the Pantone CMYK coded, you'll notice by putting in 7562 is the number, <clears throat> um, nothing shows up. But as soon as I hit you know, the little button here and I go to the right, you can see under Pantone color bridge coded, let's go to I don't want bridge coded, but you can see metal. Uh, I'm just going to hit this again, and I'm going to go to um, color books, and I want to go down here to I want Pantone solid coded, and there is our little um, color swatch. That if I select it and I bring up the um, color panel, you'll notice that it's been added. All, uh, automatically to our uh, our swatches, okay? And then what we can do, and this is what they want us to do, is they want us to create a tint of it. So with this selected, if I come back up here, you notice that it gives us an option for a tint. That's the only option you have because these Pantone colors are meant for printing with offset lithography. And I, now I can come back and I can select, you know, I forget what they wanted, but I'll select maybe 50% or something like that. How about 60%? Okay. Now I can close that. Now I can come back over here to my swatch panel. Notice that it's changed over here. So let's come back to swatches. And I can go ahead and I can add that. Now I've added another. Pantone color that's a tint of that. Okay. So um, most likely until you actually have experience with a printer, with a client who's going to use a printer and use, in fact, Pantone colors. Um, normally, if with offset lithography, you just start with the four basic colors, the C, M, Y, K, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Then if you want solid colors um, that are um, custom colors, you know, that maybe you want or the, or the client needs, then you may need to have a fifth color printed and that's where you would choose a Pantone color. And it would depend on what kind of paper you're using. If you're using uncoated papers then you'd have to select that. If you're using a better quality paper that is coded, then you'd have to select that. And generally the printer will have suggestions if you don't know, or if you're part of a design team, they will specify that. Okay, so that's why I couldn't find that. I had the wrong one selected. Now, in addition to that, if you would like, I can go over, here is this one. Um, because I had gone over this the other day, but not last Thursday, using um, 
uh, the, the live paint bucket to create this effect. Um, would you guys, guys like me to go over it again or not? Just put a yes or no in the chat. It's pretty cool. And again, this was designed not so much for doing what we're doing in this lesson, but instead it was designed for, you know, maybe people who designed comic books where you have a standard set of colors and sketches are done and you've created your outlines and you could go ahead and you can, um, what you need to do is you would have to create um, the, the outlines, then create the custom um, um, paint bucket, you know, the, um, that you have here with uh, um, the live paint. And then you can just go from one section to another and click. And so you do want me to go over this again. And then we're going to move on to typography. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit. Okay, so I'll select here. And let's see, I'm gonna to have to wing it because what I want to do is I'm going to, I'm gonna change the color of this to the orange. So let's bring up our swatch panel. I wasn't thinking that you guys wanted me to do this. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'm gonna select the orange fill, and that's not the fill. We want the darker one. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> and then what we want to do is I'm going to make a, a copy of this. So I'm going to click and drag, pull down, hold down the option key. And I want it to go to, I'm going to hold down the shift key as well. I want it to go down to the center of that. And I don't know that I have smart guides on. Now I can change the top one to, um, to the blue that we're using. So it's kind of a purplish color. Um, I'm going to guess and I'm going to say that's not the color I thought it was. Maybe it's this one here. No, that's not it either. It's a dark, dark, dark blue. Close enough for government work. Okay. And again, you can see that it's off a little now that it's showing. I want to move it up just a little bit. Okay. So that's how I made the copy of it. And then the very end, they want us to color these the lighter orange. Um, but what we need to do is we need to take this and we need to invert it. So I'm going to select both of these by holding down the shift key. <clears throat> both are selected and I want to rotate it. So I want to make sure that I use the rotation tool. And what I want to do over this center part here, actually, I want it to be down here, is hold down the option key and I'm going to click. And <clears throat> the rotate tool pops up. We want to see a preview. And I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I select 180 degrees, 180. Okay, so let's turn off preview, turn it back on. <clears throat> And I have the center off here. So let's go back here again. Um, I'm going to cancel it. That happens. I wanted it to be right here where my center is here. So I'm going to go ahead and click here. There we go. Now let's try again, 180. Option or Alt key, whichever. There we go. Now that's pretty close. It's not, for some reason, the um, the center of my the little square here isn't popping up. So, but instead of just clicking OK, I want to select copy. Okay. So that comes up. So I just need to move these up just a tad. So I'll select them both because I goofed a little bit. So I'm going to make sure that I select my selection tool. And I'm just going to nudge it up with my um, arrow keys on my keyboard. That's always kind of a nice way to work. Okay. So I've made copies of those. 
And now what I want to do is I want to fill these corner areas with orange. And also I want to, let's go ahead and let's select. Um, actually, before I do that, I'm going to select each one of these. I'm going to move it up a little bit. Hold down the shift key, move it up. No, no, no. I guess maybe I had to change. Let me undo that. Well, it's not exactly like theirs. It's not coming to the point, and I'm forgetting at the moment. I can figure it out, but um, what I want to do mostly is show you how to fill these little corners here. So to do that, I'm just going to lasso around the whole thing. And with it, the whole thing selected. Now what I can do is I can go to object and I can go to um, live paint and I can select make. Now what I want to do is I want to highlight over each of these. So if I go over them with the live paint tool, come on. Why aren't, there we go. Now it's highlighting them. And when I move over this corner, I can change these. So let me go ahead and select the light orange, move over the corner and click. Is that the right one? It looks like it. Let's move over the other corner. And there we go. And if you're having trouble selecting those, zoom in a little bit. Now let's move over this one. And you can see that they highlight in red. Now when they go over the pink, it's kind of hard to see. And when I move over this one, click the fill. And there are different settings for this too. You can affect not only the fill, but the stroke. There's a variety of ways of customizing this. Okay. But the point being is that what if I wanted to, I could select, let's go ahead and select the blue. Let me go outside of that. I don't want the live paint selected anymore, but I'm going to select the group selection tool. And let's go ahead and I want to select that. I guess I have to use, let's use the direct selection tool. No, nope. it, now it's being selected. Why are you doing this to me? Okay, now I want the group selection tool. And if that's not working, then I might select. And it might be my computer that's slowing down, getting kind of sluggish. Again, relates to what we were doing, you know, the, the Zoom dropped off. But um, at the moment, this is working pretty well, but it's not. Oh, I, let's see, let me go back here again. I know what I wanna do. I'm gonna select the live paint bucket. And when I go over these corners, this is what I should have. Let's select the live paint tool. There we go. Okay, so notice that when you go over each of these corners, these little slices, that's what I'm gonna change. That's, now I remember. Okay, so I'm gonna select the pink. And I'm going to go over each one of these. And when it highlights, I can go ahead and click the pink. And because it's the same color out here, it's going to match. That's how they wanted us to do that. There we go. And notice that it automatically matches what we have over here. So it's pretty cool. OK. So that's it with live paint. Um, as I said, if you're, you know, if you're interested in um, anime or comic books and that sort of thing, and it's pretty flat two-dimensional art, and you want to be able to um, fill shapes quickly, um, and you're using Illustrator to illustrate your, your comic book, then you just simply need a nice outline that you've inked, 
meaning using the pen tool or the curvature tool or something like that, select it all, convert it to um, the live paint um, sections, and then you can go over each one and you can use your palette here. And actually what I wasn't doing, but you can do is that depending on the palette that you have, if you hit the right arrow key, you can go through um, each one of the, you know, if you have the whatever palette you have selected, let's select this one here. And you can scroll through each of those by hitting the right or the left. And very quickly, you can recolor an entire bit of, of artwork. Okay. So yeah, I had forgotten about this. That that's how they wanted us to do that. But yeah, it works just fine. It's um, pretty simple to use. Um, you need to be careful when you use it though. I would reserve it for flat two-dimensional graphic pieces. Um, for really complex illustrations, I would leave it alone. Okay. So that's it for color. The next one later on when we get to color again will be gradients and blends and things like that but that won't be for another couple of lessons yet. What I wanted to do today, I'm gonna to switch gears now and I'm gonna talk about um, type. So if I look at, let's see if it's this file. Yep, this is the end file that, that it's supposed to look like. So we have, um, it just involves text. So we have, you can see that we have, um, um, ingredients, and we have basically a, um, I wouldn't say a cookbook, but instructions for strawberry lemonade and grilled trout, okay, um, for different servings. It's something that maybe you would publish on the internet, or it could be in a book, it doesn't matter. Um, we're going to fill in, we're going to start with a pretty much a blank slate. They provide the illustrations, but we're going to block in the text. And I'm going to do that on Thursday, specific to the lesson itself. But today I want to give you a background on typography and then show you when you select the type tool, which is right here, what you can do with it, where the, the features are for that, when you want to choose a specific font, if you want to um, distort it in some way, if you want to change the font size, the color, whatever you want to do with it, it will be found. There's a lot of redundancy built in here. It will be in the options menu. It's going to be in the properties panel. Um, we'll have another type um, panel as well that we can bring up for the character and paragraph styles and that sort of thing. Okie doke. So um, what I want to do is to start not by working in Illustrator, but I have for you, um, it's on my website. It's on both the um, handouts page and this week in class. It's called the typography primer. And it just gives you a little bit of background on type. Um, is there anyone here that's already had the type class? Yes, no, typography class. Not yet, okay. Well, this is, you know, pared down to um, very kind of minimal approach to it. So um, these are just the, the bare bones basic, basics of typography so that when you are using the type tool, you'll understand what the different aspects of the tool do and can do, okay? and also familiarize yourself with some of the terminology and nomenclature that's used in describing type and measuring type, that sort of thing. So for example, the typeface that I have used here for typography is called Roman because Western typography is based on Trajan's column, which exists in Rome, it was chiseled in stone, and at that time it had a distinct proportioning system. It also only existed in caps, in uppercase capital letters, no lowercase. It's elegant, it's still used today. It's, you know, really um, beautiful, um, incredibly designed. 
Um, you'll notice, for example, the little, these are called serifs that extend from the cross member of the key, the foot of the, um, the key and the Y and the P. Um, those originally existed because they were chiseled with just that. Uh, they used a hammer and a chisel and the flat edge of the chisel created these. So today they sort of have, have a decorative appearance, but in fact, it, it turns out that they um, exist today for more than visual decorative um, uh, you know, appearances that in fact they have, they add in the legibility of the type. They make it easier to read, especially when you're using um, type for body copy for, you know, lots of, 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 of words and paragraphs and big blocks of text. Um, so you'll, if you, if you pay close attention to most magazines, most books, not all, but most books, most um, newspapers, they use like Times Roman, Times New Roman, serif, um, serif type for the, their, um, their basic text. Now, most type or all type, I should say, is broken down into these five categories. As we saw a moment ago, with serif, but you'll notice these have lowercase letters. This is um, Times Roman. So this is a newer um, uh, iteration of the old Roman type um, that's now based on a separate um, uh, proportioning system. Then in the early 20th century, as technology developed, they were able to modify type and refine it even further and that's where sans serif type um, evolved, when and where it evolved, which means that they were able to leave off the little serifs, the little feet, if you, want to call, if you want to call it that. Now, what this enabled type designers to do was to create many more variations of a particular typeface. That what you could do is you could create, um, for, for example, what I used here for the sans serif is Helvetica. And there are many, many fonts available for Han Helvetica from heavy to you know, bold, to italic, to extended, to condensed, to a normal, which is what I use here, and on and on and on. Lots of variations to create you know, the various fonts that you can't do with most um, serif typefaces and especially Roman because of their proportion system. It just didn't lend itself to that. You can't even have italic on some of them. So for most of the time, when you have a large block of text, um, you can either rely on serif or sans serif for that. If you, it also works um, equally well for headlines and subheads. It's useful for everything. Then the next category is script based on um, uh, a steel point pen. Um, this has turned out to be something that's more in the line with decorative today. It has limited use. It's difficult for most people to read. So um, it's used for um, baby announcements, for wedding announcements, things like that. Or if, if, if it functions well, for example, um, if you're doing a movie poster or something like that for a headline where it's, the type is quite large, <clears throat> And you limit the number of words that you're used, you know, that um, are described by the, the font. So if it's just a handful of words, you know, three, four, five, that's okay. But if it's a large block of text, stay away from it. It's just too hard for most people to read. Then the next category is black letter. This was developed in the, in the dark ages around one, you know, I'm going to say 1000 AD, but it was before that and after that when monks created their manuscripts and they lettered it by hand with a broad pen. And it was at that time that the lowercase letters evolved. This is still used today, but again, it has special, unique functions. Um, again, it's like script in the sense that if you have a large block of text, it just doesn't read well. If it's for a headline or a subhead 
where the text is quite large and you have just a handful of letter forms, uh, you know, of letters and words, then it's okay to use it. And then the last category is decorative. And there are thousands and thousands of decorative typefaces that are available today. So <clears throat> even though I've told you that there are five basic categories <clears throat> or families of type, I really think that there are only three that I would put script and block letter in the same category is decorative. Okay. And again, I would reserve script, black letter, and decorative only for headlines, maybe subheads for large, um, uh, uh, large um, sizes of text with just a handful of, of, of words or letters, and that's it. The next is um, how type is broken down that you may have already noticed if you're using Microsoft Word or any other program like that. It's you say, what font do you want to choose? Well, it's broken down into family, face, and font. The family of type is that what we've used here is the sans serif. The actual type face is um, Helvetica, OK? And then within the, the typeface Helvetica, as I mentioned, because it is a modern typeface, it's sans serif, they were able to create, you know, they were able to generate a whole variety of fonts, and I don't even have all of them listed here. But you can see I have range from condensed black, condensed bold, ultra light, and bold italic, and everything in between. Now, what font pertains to is that within a type, specific type face that if you pick Helvetica regular, then what that pertains to is all of the caps, the uppercase letters, all of the small letters or lowercase, the numerals and special characters that were especially designed for that particular um, font within that category. And oftentimes they all look, you know, maybe you'll look at a, a, a lowercase g. It might look very similar and regular as opposed to bold, but I can guarantee you there are subtleties, subtle changes that the designers have made to make sure that they all work together um, beautifully, okay? No matter what letter forms you put next to one another. And that would be true for the, the numerals and the special, char the special characters as well, okay? So when you see the word font, generally falls under a category or not yeah, falls under the, the heading of a, a specific typeface and then that typeface falls under the category a larger category of type family and that would be either serif sans serif or it could be a, um, um, a decorative type okay so the next thing that i want to talk about are the different parts of the letter forms so these are the parts and they all have names assigned to them. I have not included all of them. Um, this is just, again, the very basics that you should know. That for example, when you are setting a line of type that the letter forms rest, rest on something called the baseline, that's what this is. And when we go to Illustrator or if you're in Photoshop or any other program for that matter, typically you can, um, graphics program that is, you can see the baseline that they rest on. You'll notice that some of the letter forms sit exactly on the baseline and some like the O, the D, extend slightly below. That's because optically it look, they look like they are resting on it. If I were to move the O and the D up a little bit, it would, um, so that they were resting on the baseline, it would actually look like they were floating above slightly. And then with the lowercase letters, they all rest <clears throat> on a line two that's called the waistline. That's what that is right there. And then each of the lowercase letters that extend above that waistline are called like um, the vertical of this D is called the A sender and the extension of the, the Y that extends below the baseline is called the D sender. These are important terms to remember. 
And then the other thing is, um, how is type measured? Um, there's a couple of ways of doing it. If you want type to be measured, let's say 72 point, but you want it to be based on the cap height, then you need to specify that. And that would go from the baseline to the top of the capital letter. But you'll notice in some cases, depending on how the, the type is designed, that the, the A sender actually extends above the cap height a little bit. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does. Okay. So if I didn't specify that I wanted the cap height 72 point, and I just said, I want the type set at 72 point, the way the type is measured is from the top of the A sender to the bottom of the D sender. So depending on the font you choose will determine um, how visually how, even though you might have two different fonts set, sitting next to one another, one may look larger or than another one, or one may look smaller than the one next to it, based on how it was its overall design. And then the last thing that I want to talk about that the measurement, and this isn't talked about so much anymore, is that from the baseline to the waistline, if you wanted a specific measurement there, that's called the X height. So anytime you're talking to a graphic designer, um, someone that's um, in print business, um, typesetters don't exist anymore, but um, somebody who is knowledgeable in type, these are some of the terms that are called, that are used. For example, um, one, the negative space, for example, on the O is called the counter. With a K, we have arms and legs and so on and so forth. Um, they have all, you know, lots of different parts that are associated with it. But these, I thought, would be the basic ones that you should commit to memory or become familiarized with as you're using the type. Now, the next thing that I wanted to cover is how type is measured. <clears throat> and it has a unique um, system of measurement. That are, uh, the way type and also strokes are measured are in points and picas. Um, to let you know, um, it's just like in, you know, 12 inches equal a foot and three feet equal a yard and that sort of thing. Well, 12 points equal one pica and six picas equal one inch. So if you simply do the math, if you say six times 12, there are 72 points in an inch. So that's dividing an inch into a small unit of measurement. But believe it or not, um, the difference between 11 and 12 point or six and seven point is visually very noticeable. It's not insignificant. And I can guarantee you that um, graphic designers who are tie pounds will argue over whether you should use 10 or 11 or 11 or 12 or six or seven or seven or eight point type. Okay. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, how type size is measured is from the distance of the top of the, the A center to the bottom of the D center. Okay, so if you're wondering, you know, where, it, you know, I specified 72 point, but it looks so much smaller. And when it's printed out, it's smaller because you're, you're thinking in terms of cap height, possibly. Now, some other terms that you should know because they're, um, useful and they're available when you use the type tool in Illustrator and in Photoshop. Our cap, capital letters are also called uppercase or UC. And the small letters are also are, are called lowercase sometimes or LC. And where those two terms are derived from is um, back in the day when Benjamin Franklin in the 18th century had his own type shop or his own print shop, and they would set the type by hand um, in these, these um, wooden cases um, that the capital letters were set in cases above and the lower case and the small letters were set in cases below. So they were lowercase, uppercase. Those terms continue today. The other thing is, is that um, maybe there are times when you want to make selective adjustments between individual letter forms and words or words or both. That term is called kerning. And there's a tool available <clears throat> in Illustrator that allows you to do that. 
if you want to uniformly adjust the space between letters and words, then that, in effect, is called tracking. And again, you want to make sure that you are at least familiar with these terms. Then the last term, which also um, developed the same time, is um, uppercase and lowercase. Is called letting. And that's the space between the lines of type. And how that term came to be is that when they wanted more space between lines of type, they would put these little slivers of lead between them. Again, that continues today. Okay, even in computers. And what when computer graphics were developed with those programs like Illustrator. Is everybody still there? Because it cut out again. Um, I lost signal. So um, let me go ahead and uh, keep going. Yeah, I'm still here, but um, I had to sign back in. It quit on me. And it could very well quit again. So when I'm done with this little lecture today, we'll, um, we may have to extend this over a couple of more sessions. Um, we'll see. So let me go ahead and share my screen again. So where I left off was letting, it's still recording, I presume. Um, yeah, it's still recording. So I guess it's gonna get these pauses in here, whatever. Uh, so much for technology, huh? So, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad most of you are still here. So if it cuts out again, um, maybe that will be it. I think I can at least finish this for today. We'll keep going until it does. Okay, so we'll go on to the next part. Okay. Now, this technically is not a layout for an ad. It's a layout for um, a newspaper, a tabloid-sized newspaper. But what I wanted to cover is heads, subheads, and copy, which are distinct different categories of sizes of type and functions of type. So technically, this is not a headline. This is a masthead. But if this were in an ad, it would be called a headline. And also where we have subhead here, this technically would be a headline in a newspaper, but in an ad, it would be called a subhead. Likewise, here we have a subhead here. This is actually a headline for an article here. And all the small type here that is indicated with breaking or just lines, is called copy, or just body copy. Okay, and that's the you know basic structure of most ads, most um, uh, brochures. Any you know it could be um, a poster that you're developing. You know you have headlines or you have titles or whatever. That's the largest, and it goes down to the smallest. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you, you know, if you're not sure where to get started, most copy size is starts at around eight point and goes up to 13. 
depending on you know who your target audience is and who you like to design for. The column widths range from 13 and a half pikes to 48. If you are looking at, hold on one here. I see something in the chat here. It's cutting out again. Oh man. Yeah, the audio is cutting out. Okay, then let me um, switch here. I'm gonna go from, let's, let's try this. How is that now? Is that any better? That's good now? Okay. Okay, let's keep going. And if there's problems, let me know. Anyway, um, if you look at newspapers, the way they're divided, and many newspapers are divided into eight columns, they generally have a column width of 13 and a half picas. And then if you look at a, most books, they have a maximum width of 48 picas. And that's because for whatever reason that width is established or was established because anything wider than that, it's difficult for your eye to track from one line to the next. So those are the standards that have, um, it, have been established and exist today. Um, subheads generally go from 14 to 18 points. And then headlines can start on a, on a, a sheet of paper, eight and a half, and a late by 11 letterhead or letter size paper can start at 24 point and be as large as you want them. Um, no, you don't see me at all. You don't see the um, the image that I have. Wait, oh, okay, it's cleared up. We're good now. Okay, okay. Well, it is what it is. That's the end of this. So let's move on to um, our lesson. This I will go over. You know. Probably not all of it, but we'll go over most of it on Thursday. In the meantime, I wanted to just start with a blank piece of paper here. There we go. And select the type tool. And as I select it, I'm going to notice a little tick mark in the lower right hand corner. I want to tear off that tab to show you all the variations of the type we have available to us. Okay, so I'm gonna click here. And come on, like, there we go. It's not allowing me, it's getting kind of sluggish here. And I have some text over here that somehow was added. I don't want that. But again, you can, you know, move this stuff anywhere. So let's see how far I can take this today. Anyway, we have the text tool. You'll notice that the variations of it inside here. This is just for a line of text or for a block of text. If you want text to fit in a specific area of a shape, then you use this one next to it. The next one after that is if you want text to follow a path. And then the next two, or the next three, I should say, are very similar, but the text is set vertically rather than horizontally. Okay, so we've got that. Then what you'll see at the very top is also reflected over here as well to the right under the properties panel when you look at characters. Okay, we have for the characters, we have the fill and then we have the stroke. 
for each of them. If we look down here under character, by default, Myriad Pro is the font that or the type, the family that's selected. The font is regular. If there are more variations of that, they will be found underneath here. I'm cutting out again. Oh, shit. Okay. You know what? <clears throat> is it okay now? <clears throat> We're running up. Can everybody hear me? Yes, no. I was going to say we're running close to the, the three o'clock hour. So a little bit better, but can't see the screen. Well, that's not good. Okay, then. Um, Let's end the webinar for today. And we'll try again on Thursday. Okay. So I'm going to pause the recording. Just, I'm gonna, yeah.